going back to 1981. That's Thomas Dolby with Europa and the Pirate Twins right here on That Modern Rock Show. And we're excited tonight because Thomas Dolby is our guest. And aside from his reputation as an electronics wizard, he's also, and, and really I should say mainly, a tremendous songwriter and musician. And we're thrilled to have him on to talk about his new album, A Map of the Floating City. And among his many achievements, and these include songs we all know and love like Hyperactive and uh, she blinded me with science and wind power and airhead and all these great songs. Apart from that, another distinction that Thomas Dolby has, he's recently had, she blinded me with science covered by William Shatner and Bootsy Collins. Welcome to the show, Thomas Dolby. What's the deal with William Shatner? I don't, you know, I just don't follow closely enough. Uh, William Shatner has a, uh, a side career in speak singing. And what kind of people listen to William Shatner? Are they Star Trek fans? Are they uh, Shatner fans? I, I, a little, a little of both, a little of both. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's it's a very unique interpretation. Well, it is, and they did a good job actually with the backing track. Uh, I, I trust Bootsy to do a good job there. And, yeah, uh, you know he's a good guy and a great musician, and uh, it's a good choice, I think, by. If William Shatner is responsible for choosing the uh, musician <laughs> to do the backing tracks, I think he did a good job. All right. Well, you know, you've put out so many great records over the year, The Golden Age of Wireless, The Flat Earth, which incidentally is the first uh, Thomas Dolby record that I ever bought on cassette back in 1984, Aliens Ate My Buick. And then in 1992, we got Astronauts and Heretics, and I kept waiting and waiting for the next Thomas Dolby album and cue the shot of, you know, tumbleweeds uh, across the Western town because for for 15 years or so, we've got nothing from you. So what precipitated this return to making music and why did you take uh, all that time off? Yeah, well, I broke up. (laughs) (laughs) No, I mean, seriously, at the beginning of the 90s, uh, if you remember, it was a bad time for music. Mm -hmm. Uh, The cracks were starting to show. Uh, The writing was on the wall. The first digital downloads and record sales were tailing tapering off and so on. And uh, conversely, in Silicon Valley, it was all happening. It was the very early days of the internet. Right. Uh, venture capital funding was pouring into the craziest ideas. And uh, the web came about, which was terribly exciting. And uh, you know me, I, I just, I go where the center of gravity is. Um, you know, when it was, in the early days, when it was electronic music and synthesizers, that's where I went. And then there was music video, and so I got into music video. Later, there was uh, computer-based music and virtual reality and computer games and so on. I like working in a medium where nobody really knows what the heck they're doing. That's where I'm most creative, really. And um, so that's really why you know I went to, to the tech side in the 90s. Uh, it was never supposed to take 15 years. Right, uh, but one thing led to another, and my company sort of trod water for ages and ages, and then eventually kind of hit pay dirt um, in the most unlikely of fashions. Uh, for years and years, we were very popular as a download and mm-hmm. made up zero dollars, uh, and then suddenly the world's largest mobile phone maker came and licensed our technology and put it in every one of their phones for the last 13, 14 years. And um, so eventually I was able to get out of that and get back into music, which is my first love. So, and I should say for listeners that you developed ringtone technology. Is that what you helped develop? Well, it's basically the mixer and the synthesizer that does all the sound in your phone. Ah. So it might, it might be, I mean, it's the voice is processed through it. But if in the middle of a call, um, you know, you, you have an MP3 uh, song finishes downloading and you get a beep, Right. or um, you have an alarm goes, goes off, you need basically a little synthesizer and mixer done in software in the phone that is very efficient to mix all of that sound, and that's what Beatnik makes. So the image of you tinkering away on the cover of the Golden Age of Wireless is not too far off from the truth. Well, it's very close to the <laughs> yeah. truth, actually. It was, it was somewhat prophetic. Um, but, I mean, I find that actually... Uh, you know, in my lyrics, and there's nothing spooky about this, I think it's just wishful thinking. If I write a song about Beechwood Avenue, then I end up living there. Or, you know, I wrote I wrote about Westchester in one song, and I married a girl from Westchester. Mm-hmm. I wrote about Shingle Street, which is now where I live. And um, 
I wrote about a lifeboat and ended up doing my new album in a converted lifeboat. Yeah, I have to ask you about that because I'm a little confused. Is is this on the water? No, my house is, is on the beach uh, okay. in a very remote village in the east of England. And um, we flood from time to time. And so it didn't make sense for me to have the proverbial garden shed, you know, right. um, with a studio in it. I decided instead that I needed a floating studio in case the floodwaters came, ah, uh, in which case I would rise up like Noah and float off into the sunset uh, <laughs> making music. Obviously, you, you, you must have a pretty decent studio in there, I would think. Well, I mean, these days, you know, you can have a pretty decent studio in your laptop. Right. Um, I wouldn't, you know, when I recorded a string quartet or a mariachi horn section for my album, I didn't do it on the lifeboat. It's not really set up for that. Right. But it's a great place to sit and think and, and work out ideas. And these days, you know, anything you do can be used in the final product. It's not like the old days where you'd make demos, you know, and then, and then go into the studio to, to do it for real. The flip side is that now hundreds of thousands of people in the world are sitting in coffee shops making albums, right? Um, using all basically the same the same technology. So I don't have the patience for that. And I mean, you know, people are, are making electronic music as obsessively as they play World of Warcraft. You know, right. they're immersing themselves in it for, for weeks on end. And there's no way. I mean, they're coming out with remarkable stuff, and it's all great. Um, but there's no way that I want to compete with that. What I have over them, which they don't have, is songwriting craft. And I can write songs with intros and verses and choruses and middle eights and melodies, chord sequences, arrangements, you know, I can and I can tell a story with my songs. And so that's what I'm focused on. I don't really care about the sounds. Um, I'm not trying to blow your mind with sounds anymore. Right. It's about the songs and about the personality and, and the, the emotion. Well, there's something that uh, has been a hallmark of your songwriting, I felt anyway, uh, going back to the, the first record I ever picked up from you, is you have very solid songs, but you usually, lyrically, you usually have an unusual spin. Yeah, I mean, each, each one of my songs is a little sort of concept album unto itself, and um, very often the first thing I get is the title, and it's a bit like writing a movie script. I mean, every sound, every line of lyrics... Uh, has to relate to the to the concept. So the concept, the high concept of each strong, each song is very strong. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think lyrically there's definitely a, a, an interesting spin. I mean, I've never been one for the conversational sort of you know ooh baby call right. me kind of lyrics. <laughs> um, I'm very influenced by my environment. You know, there's a lot of songs about nature, about about the geography of where I am, and that's why on a map of the floating city there are these three continents which are fictional continents, they're not real places. Uh, they represent the sort of three flavors, really, of the, of the music that I wanted to make on this album. Uh, Americana with a K, Obanoia and Oceania. Each one has a very distinctive flavor. And initially you released, I think, two of them as EPs? Yeah, the first one came out just as a sort of private EP for people on my fan list. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was really a heads up of, you know, I'm in the studio writing some songs, Here's a batch. Check them out. Tell me what you think. Um, and then that, that did pretty well. So the second one, Americana, sorry, the second one, Oceaneer, I released commercially um, and put it out to radio. Uh, although it's very, it's a very chilled out EP. Uh, you know, it got some sort of you know NPR type chilled out stations right. uh, playing it, which was great um, and attracted a lot of attention and you know sort of set the tone really for the album when it came out. My plan had been to release the last EP, Urban Noia, as an EP as well. Um, but I decided that, you know, nobody's really buying records these days, uh, but they are playing games a lot and spending a lot of time on social networks. So I thought, well, it would be more appropriate in this day and age as a way of promoting an album to a new audience to build a social network around it, around a game concept. So that's what I did with... Um, with the last EP, and it became the Floating City Game. You mentioned sometimes getting a title before you have the song written and then writing the song to, to fit the title. Was that the case with the song Evil Twin Brother on the new album? Yeah, you know, it was a title and an atmosphere, really. Um, it's a song about denial. Uh, it reminded me a lot of Michael Jackson in terms of both the phrasing and the fact that 
that form of denial is something that he was very good at. Right. Uh, you know, I didn't really hang my kid out of the window by. Um, and, uh, and, and so, yeah, I mean, it it was a fictional story really. I mean, I I did come up with it at about three o'clock in the morning on a very hot night in New York city. Um, when I couldn't, I was jet lagged and I couldn't sleep and I, and I did actually go out and get a bite to eat at a, at a, a mostly empty diner. And there was a sort of East European waitress there. And I, I drifted off into this sort of jet lagged fantasy about, about her. (laughs) <laughs> and about meeting her after her shift and going off to a sort of Euro trash <laughs> nightclub down an alley. And, uh, but throughout it all, there's this detachment. You know, it wasn't me. It must have been my evil twin brother. And you also have uh, Regina Spector on uh, that track. Yes, yeah, so Regina played the part of the Russian waitress, Yelena. And uh, I'd worked with Regina on the TED conference. And she was kind enough to do a cameo for me. And, of course, she grew up in Russia until she was 10 or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think she had to ask a couple of her older relatives uh, how to translate some of the words that I needed her to say. But she does a, a really good job as this sort of sultry uh, Russian waitress in the song. You seem to have an affinity for New York. Are you coming back anytime soon? Yeah, I mean, I, my wife is from New York, well, from Westchester, mm-hmm. um, but is pretty much a New York gal. And I have uh, in-laws there. And so I have a very strong affinity for the city. I love being there for about 48 hours at a time. Okay. And then I sort of get onto overload and uh, have to get the heck out of there. And this is really what Urbanoia is about. You know, this is, I'm just not naturally a city person. I get charged up when I go into town. But uh, right. uh, after a couple of days, I'm just yearning for the tranquility of the country. So it's a case of... Uh, Green Acres is the place for me. <laughs> I should tell everybody that, again, the album is A Map of the Floating City, and it's your first record in, I guess, what, 17 years, 18 years? Yeah, it's about 18 yeah. years. And, and now I have to ask you, can we expect another long period of time between the next one? or, or Another are, 18 years? Yeah, are you, are you, are you <laughs> going think, to uh, get on a schedule here? <laughs> we're all going to be pretty long in the tooth. <laughs> 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 now, but. No, I mean, I'm back now. I, I, as I say, it was an extended sabbatical away from music, and it's longer than I really intended to be away. Uh, but yeah, I'll be making more albums and touring. I'm going to be touring the U.S. in the spring. I uh, should be coming through the New York area in, I believe, the middle of March. And um, yeah, I'm really enjoying being back out there again, connecting with audiences and um, spreading the word. And uh, it's a fantastic time for music. I mean... You know, we have to remember that music is not about the record companies and the managers and, and the middlemen. It's it's about the musicians and the fans. And it's actually a great time uh, for musicians and fans. It's, it's a wide open playing field. And I'm very optimistic. A musician no longer needs an investor to get his or her career off the ground. Uh, a, because you can record albums cheap. And B, because when you, when you market and promote a, mu- music, uh, a musician or a band, don't have to throw money needlessly at the wall. You don't have to book the back page of Billboard magazine for tens of thousands of dollars or, or buy 30-second TV commercial slots. You can go on, on you know, Facebook or Google ads and you can be laser accurate with the way that you target your promotions. And you don't have to spend money needlessly. Um, I, you know, I think the manager of the future is going to be like a day trader, a guy surrounded by computer monitors watching in real time how people react to the band's music and only spending money where it's really needed. Well, Thomas, we're so glad that you're back and uh, that we have more music to look forward to. And where can people go to find out what you're up to? Yeah, well, go to thomasdolby.com. Sign up for my mailing list and we'll keep you informed. Uh, if I'm coming through your area, please come and see us live. I've got a great band at the moment, just finished a UK tour. And, uh, you know, after the holidays, so we'll be getting ready to come back to the U.S. and tour in the spring. And by the way, I have a request for when you tour in the spring. Okay. Uh, the keys to your Ferrari. Ah, okay. Because I, I don't think I've ever heard you play that live. Yeah, it's it's a rare one. Uh, I've done it with a horn section before now. Yeah. And, um, uh, we may have to figure out a way to do that uh, in the spring tour. I've given you a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks so much, Thomas. All right. Nice talking to you.